And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this, your word. Thank you for preserving it for us, even allowing us to have it in our own hands this morning, to hear it read in a language that we understand we pray, O oh God, that now you would give us more than human understanding, that you would open our eyes so we could behold wondrous things, that by your spirit, spiritual understanding, you would teach us and train us, correct us, even rebuke us for righteousness' sake. Would you make us more like Jesus? Help us to know, help us to celebrate the victory that we have through him. Father, be with your people Be with me, your servant. Protect me from error, I pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable unto you, O God. You are my rock and my redeemer. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm actually excited to dive back into the book of Revelation. Perhaps you're new to the chapel, or maybe you just need a refresher But this is actually our third sermon series in the book. It's our third installment. Last year, we spent time in chapters 1 through 11 in two different series. Uh, One was called King of Hearts, and the other was called King of Ages. And if you'd like to revisit those messages, you can find them on our website. You can go to YouTube, they're there, or even wherever you get your podcasts, you can find them. But as we start this new series, which I've titled King of Kings, and it covers chapters 12 through 16... I thought it would be helpful to remind you of a few things that can help us navigate this difficult book. And so briefly, I want to give you what we might call footholds, footholds that help us scale this mountain that is the book of Revelation. So first, I want you to remember what John wrote back in chapter 1, verse 3. Would you turn over there with me? Revelation 1, verse 3. Pastor loves the sound of pages turning. Revelation 1, verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. And frankly, I'm simply amazed that with such a resounding invitation, so many Christians fail to spend time in this book. In the book of Revelation, as a a congregation that we are who stands firm on the foundation of God's word, as a people who want to stand on the firm foundation of God's word, we have to plant our feet even in this book. 
And as John says, to receive God's blessing. (laughs) Receive God's blessing as we seek to live what is written out here about it. Second, I've said this before and I want to say it again this morning. Remember, Revelation is a picture book, not a puzzle book. It's a picture book, not a puzzle book. If I were to tell you that I was taking my family to Bush Stadium next month to see a game between the Cardinals and the Cubs, what would come to your mind? Would you begin to wonder how it's possible that a bird and a baby bear could play a game together? You wouldn't begin debating exactly what kind of game these two animals would play. I mean, one has wings, the other one doesn't have opposable thumbs. And hopefully you wouldn't start arguing over what kind of shrub made up the stadium and how uncomfortable it might be, even if they were bushes with thorns. No, what comes to your mind? Well, some of you, or most of you maybe, would recognize I was speaking of a baseball game, right? Speaking of a baseball game between two teams, one from St. Louis and one from Chicago, whose mascots happen to be a Cardinal and a Cub. And you would know, oh, that game's going to be played in St. Louis at Bush Stadium. Yeah, that stadium named after that family who owns a beer company. Likewise, the book of Revelation is written in a genre that we call apocalyptic literature, And though it does convey actual events and gospel truth, it does so in images. It does so in pictures. Apocalyptic literature is picture book, not puzzle book literature. And third, I want you to remember that the book of Revelation is structured or outlined so that it shows seven parallel accounts of the same period of time. The time between Jesus' ascension to heaven and his second coming when he returns. I'm sorry, but I have no fancy charts. I have creation, time. I'll start over here from your left to right. Creation, all this time. Finally, Christ comes. He's born in Bethlehem. He lives. He dies. He rises again. He raises. He ascends into heaven. And there he sits not just sitting though, right? He's ruling and reigning over his church and we're waiting for that final day when he returns, okay? That's my chart. A line and three arrows. No fancy charts. We've already seen three of these accounts, three of these parallel accounts of this time period. Remember we saw the seven lampstands in chapters one through three? We saw the seven seals and the seven trumpets in chapters four through 11. And now in this series, we're gonna look at the next two, four and five of the parallel sections. We have the persecuting dragon here in chapters 12 through 14, and then we have the seven bulls in chapters 15 and 16, and then later this year, we're going to return to Revelation. We'll take a break. We'll return, and we have our last series, King of Glory, which will cover the last two parallel accounts, which you can find in chapters 17 through 22. Seven parallel accounts of the same time period from Jesus' ascension until his return, You get a look at this redemptive history in the gospel age or the church age, you might call it, from different perspectives, I would say even intensifying perspectives. For example, you remember in chapters 1 through 11, we got to witness the various trials and judgments faced by the church and the world here on earth. Now, it gets really interesting. In chapters 12 through 14, we kind of get a behind-the-scenes glimpse. We get a picture of what's happening behind the scenes of the spiritual battle that is taking place behind everything we see here in the physical realm. And so those are the three footholds I want you to keep in mind as we study together these next few weeks, several weeks. So all that in mind, let's turn to the passage before us. Chapter 12, as a whole, is really two parts. I've broken it up into two parts, so we'll get the second part next week, but they're overlapping. So if it appears that I'm glossing over some detail today, don't worry, I will go back to it next week. And so to help us understand what's here before us, I'm gonna address it in three points. So if you're taking notes, here's your three points for this morning. First is the signs, the signs. Second is the war, the war. And third, the victors. The victors. Chapter 12 begins in verse 1 with John saying that a great sign 
appeared in heaven. And then look at verse 3. He says, another sign also appeared in heaven. And so we're going to ask the question, what are these signs? What are these signs that John sees? And the first sign, John sees a pregnant woman in celestial-like clothing crying out in agony because she is in labor. Revelation being a picture book, we would ask the question, well, who's this a picture of? Who is this woman that we see? Now, our Roman Catholics, they argue that this is the Virgin Mary. This is the Virgin Mary in her mediatorial glory. But what follows does not fit Mary's story. But look, we read in verse 17, if you just take your eyes down to 1217, that this woman's children include not just one child, but all those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So it's best to see the woman as a picture of the covenant community of God's faithful people. The covenant community of God's faithful people through whom God brought his son, the long-promised Savior into the world. This woman represents, she includes both Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church, all of God's people, living both before and after Christ's coming. She's what the Scottish covenanters of the 17th century referred to as Mother Kirk. Mother Kirk. She's the church. The church as the bride of Christ. And as they said, the mother in whose nursery God's children are raised. A woman represents God's covenant community. The second sign, John sees a red dragon. Now, if the first sign has a lot of debate behind it, and there is a lot of debate behind it, there's not much debate over this second one. Most commentators, almost all, there's always a few that don't, but most commentators see this red dragon as Satan, especially since, look at verse 9. He's called Satan, okay? And while many people today, they can read, they know, okay, it's talking about Satan, but they'll dismiss the devil. Oh, that's crazy. That's just mere fantasy, a mere myth. I'm going to tell you, you cannot take the Bible seriously without believing in Satan, without believing in this personal and powerful spirit, the fallen archangel, who is the chief enemy of Christ and the chief enemy of God's people. Where do we first meet this enemy? In the Garden of Eden, right? That's where we meet this enemy. He appears as the serpent who does what? He deceives Adam and Eve and he tempts them. And what did they do? They broke God's command. They ate of the forbidden, the fruit from the forbidden tree. And what happened? Mankind was plunged into sin, right? And so God shows up. He addresses them. What happens in 3.15 of Genesis? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God makes a promise. He promises that there would be warfare between Satan's servants and the children of the woman. This is what God says in Genesis 3.15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Enmity here is murderous hatred, warfare. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. So in one way, we can look at all of history, right? We can look at all of history, particularly you can look at Old Testament history in some sense as the outworking of this conflict between Satan and God's covenant people centered around the true seed of the woman, who is Jesus Christ, and Satan's opposition to Christ himself. For take note what the rest of Genesis 3.15 says. It reads this way. He shall bruise your head. That's what he tells Satan, the seed of the woman. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. One of those is a fatal blow crushing of the head. So it's no surprise then to see this intensified picture of the serpent as a dragon standing before the woman, ready to devour the child whom she is about to give birth to. For this is what Satan has always sought to do. He's always sought to devour the godly seed. From Cain killing Abel, 
to Pharaoh ordering that all male sons be cut off from the womb and killed, to Haman seeking to wipe out all of the Israelites from Babylon, and all those accounts in between. The Old Testament is an unfolding story of this very conflict. Satan is raging with murderous passion, and he's focused on one objective— Destroy the godly seed. Destroy the promised Savior before that Savior could put an end to his evil domain. But Satan can't, and he won't. For in this second sign, John sees the male child born. One, and he's really quoting here from Psalm 2, will rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And what happens to this child? Though Satan pursues him, it says that he is caught up to God and to his throne. Did Satan pursue Jesus while he was here on earth? Absolutely. Even Herod tried to have all the babies killed. He was even brought into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Satan pursued him, but he couldn't. He lived, he died, he rose again, he ascended to the throne. It's clear who the child is. There's not a lot of debate about that either. It's Jesus the one who ascended into heaven and who sits on his throne. But what happens to the woman? What happens to the church? To the covenant people of God? Verse 6 answers. Verse 6 says that she flees into the wilderness. Notice it's a place prepared for her by God. It's a place to be nourished by God even while she faces trial and tribulation. Where do we get trial and tribulation from? Well, it unfolds throughout chapter 12. We'll look at it a little more next week, but you may remember from our previous studies that 1,262 days is 42 months. It's half of seven, right, of seven years. It's three and a half. It, it symbolizes a limited period of time, a limited period of time. It's, it's half the whole, so it focuses on persecution. It's the age that we find ourselves living in right now, it's not to be taken as a literal 1260 days. It's the time period of tribulation and trial. Remember, Jesus addresses the church clearly at the beginning, not just the church there in Asia Minor, but for all the churches. This is what you will endure for my namesake. This is what you will endure. Yet even so, when you read this, it's kind of scary, right? <laughs> We're thrown into the wilderness. But notice, notice though, take heart. It's exactly what God planned for the church. Don't forget that even though we are a wilderness people, he protects us. He nourishes us. And the time is defined. It's going to come to an end. And that's the joy of this book. It was the joy to the early Christians who first heard it. And it should be a joy to us that all of this trial and tribulation will one day come to an end when Christ returns. And in the meantime, God doesn't just leave us alone. He protects us and he nourishes us. And we'll get an even bigger picture of that as we go through these chapters. So John sees two signs. He sees the woman, he sees the dragon. And next in verses 7 through 10, John gets a glimpse of a war, a heavenly war in heaven. And that's our second point this morning. We see now that there is much more going on than just that spiritual war here on earth. But there's also warfare in the spiritual realm, the spiritual realm of angels as well. And John here is hearkening back to the book of Daniel. And if you read in the book of Daniel, the Michael the archangel is described in chapter 10, verse 13, as a chief prince. He's a chief prince. And we encounter him now fulfilling what is later said in the book of Daniel. And you can write this down and read it later in chapter 12, and particularly verse 1. At that time, and it's speaking of the new covenant age, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. So here in Revelation 12, 7, once Jesus ascends to heaven, John gets a picture of that, and he sees Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fight back. What a movie that would make, right? This war is going on. But what happens? The dragon and his angels are defeated. And they're cast out of heaven. They're thrown down to the earth. 
Think about Luke chapter 10, verse 18. When the 72 returned from preaching the gospel and they cast out demons in Jesus' name. And think about John 12, 31, where Jesus is addressing the teachers of the day. In light of his redemptive work that he's doing here on earth, in those two passages, listen to what Jesus declares. In, in Luke 10, 18, after these 72 come back, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And then in John 12, 31, he says, now, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. You see, before Christ ascended to heaven, before he bruised the head of Satan upon the cross, Satan had access to heaven. Satan had access to come into the court of God and abuse or accuse God's people. You might be thinking, what? <laughs> Where are you getting that from? Turn over to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions, and you've increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand, only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. You see, before Christ came, Satan had access to the heavenly throne room. But now, with the glorious appearing of Christ, and with Christ's death and resurrection, his ascension into heaven, Satan has been cast down to earth along with his demonic spirits where he once accused God's people in heaven, he does so no longer. For as the loud voice declares in our passage, look at verse 10, this loud voice that he hears, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Don't you see? Where Satan once stood in heaven accusing God's people, he's now gone. And who stands there now? The resurrected, ascended Jesus. And Jesus intercedes for us before the Father. Jesus stands between the Father and Satan, the accuser, and he says, no more. Now you have to come through me. Or maybe I should put it in the words of Gandalf as he faced the Balrog on the bridge of Khazad Doom in the movie The Fellowship of the Rings. Do you remember? You shall not pass. You shall not pass. We're going to spend more time next week and the week to come to, to see how this war continues and what role Satan and his demonic forces have in that role because it's real and it's happening all around us. But to wrap things up today, I want us to focus on verse 11 and our third point this morning. I want us to focus on the victors, on the victors. Look again with me at verse 11. And they, and they, the brothers and sisters who were accused by Satan, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. You see, it was not only Christ who defeated Satan, but it is the people of God, the covenant community, the church, Christ's body who has defeated him too. Satan's warfare of accusation against believers has been defeated by the blood of Christ, it says, and by our gospel witness. The church is victorious. 
Not the church will be, that's true, but the church is victorious. Before Jesus' redemptive work on the cross, Satan had a pretty good case against God's people, didn't he? Satan had a pretty good case. They were unable to keep God's law, and they continually broke it. And even though they offered sacrifices and offerings, their guilt remained, right? What does the author of Hebrews tell us? It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. It's impossible. So their guilt remained. But when Christ came, when Christ came as the Lamb of God, and he offered his own blood to pay the penalty for the sins of his people, there was no longer any charge against them. The law had been satisfied. The wrath of God against sin, against our sin, was poured out. It was exhausted upon Christ on that cross. It was there where he became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And even though the Old Testament saints are in heaven, they're there by faith, a forward-looking faith in the coming Messiah, Now they fully realize, it's fully realized for all redemptive history that the blood of Christ that we've sang about this morning cleanses us from all sin. And when sin has been removed, what accusation can there be? When sin is taken away, what accusation can there be? Many of you are familiar with the life of the reformer Martin Luther. And there's lots of legends that have sprung up around Martin Luther. And one of my favorite stories about him is while he was hiding away in Wurtburg Castle, Wurtburg Castle, he was there translating the Bible into German for the people. And he says that Satan came, appeared to him there with a list and accused him of this list of sins. Luther looked at the list and Confess the truth of that list. He says that I went on to tell him all the other sins I had committed in my heart that wasn't on the list, because he can't know that. And I told him all of it, and then I pointed out to him that the blood of Christ has cleansed me from all sin. He says he picked up his ink bottle and he threw it at Satan and said, be gone. I haven't been there, but they say if you go to Wurtberg Castle today, you can see the ink stain on the wall where Luther threw his ink well. At Satan. See, the point is, is that the church is victorious, certainly victorious by the blood of Christ. And that's the point that's made here. We're victorious by the blood of the Lamb, but also by the word of its testimony. One of the most perplexing things about the Bible is that if Satan is defeated and knows he's defeated, why does he keep fighting? That's because he lives in denial. He wants the news of his defeat to be kept as quiet as possible. But when we spread the good news of forgiveness in Christ, when we stand and proclaim that he has no accusation against me because I'm set free in Christ, I'm set free, his power is diminished. His power is diminished. And it's interesting is that when we hold to that confession, we just don't say it, but we live it out. Though trial and tribulation and suffering comes in all of its forms, even to the point of death, what we can do is we can continue to witness and lift high the banner of victory and declare what we said earlier, greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. We join our voices with all the saints, and like it says in verse 12, We rejoice. We rejoice. Dr. Doug Kelly writes in his commentary on Revelation about growing up in a small western North Carolina town that was very strict. Dancing was forbidden in this town. Yet he tells a story about when World War II ended and the soldiers came home, all those rules were set aside and people danced in the streets. People danced in the streets. And Dr. Kelly concludes with this, how much greater then should our rejoicing be because of Christ's victory over Satan? 
how much greater should our rejoicing be? Now, I'm not suggesting we have a dance party here this morning, but we need to rejoice. I want you to see that Christ's victory and our victory through him, though it brings, and we're going to see this next week, it brings temporary suffering here on earth in this present age. It most surely brings everlasting joy in heaven. Joy that can even be experienced here on earth. We get a glimpse of it on Sunday mornings when we gather together and rejoice and sing of the blood that has the power to save. I remember I attended a church service one time. I was invited to preach, and they were going to sing Victory in Jesus. Some of you know that old hymn. It started out really slow, and everyone's like, Victory in Jesus, my Savior. If you don't know that song, you won't get it. But then some guy said, he's like, Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. And he just like belted it out, right? That's what we need to do. Victory in Jesus. We have victory in Jesus. How do we start our service this morning? Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Rejoice in the Lord and give thanks to his holy name. That is what I'm calling you to do this morning. Rejoice in the Lord and give thanks to his holy name. For once you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God made you alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. You've been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. You've been set free from sin and sorrow. Your chains are gone. You're free to walk in Christ in his victory. Amen and amen.